afternoon. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman uh, and the organising committee for inviting me to give the opening um, presentation in this session. I'm going to talk about, well, try and condense together 20 years' worth of research into the next 40 minutes. So we're going to go on a bit of a roller coaster ride, but I'll take you from uh, 1998, when the project started, all the way up to the present. The project's focused in on North Wales, which is... Um, uh, a large, we've got a large island called Anglesey, and then we have the mainland county of Gwynedd. Uh, Wales, for its national emblem, has the daffodil, although if you go there and spend any time there, I think you'd agree that that's probably wrong, and they should have chosen sheep, because it has the highest density of sheep anywhere in the UK. Uh, agriculture is still a mainstay in a lot of uh, parts of, of, of Wales. As Italians, of course, you may well be familiar with uh, Wales from a, from a rugby context. Um, rugby is the national sport of Wales. It's a population of 3.5 million, and they have an extremely good rugby team as uh, Scott, and as Italians, you'll probably be well aware. So, uh, conservation action, what's it about? It's really a marriage of three different things, ecological knowledge, money, and politics. So I want to just talk about politics initially, if I could. Let's look at Wales. In Wales, 30% of children come from households which are in poverty. And if we were to, to take a, a varying political snapshots of the country, what we would find is, uh, in terms of Welsh language, where Welsh is the, is the first language and English is the second language, uh, this is shown in this figure here, where the, the, the deeper the colour of green, the higher the percentage of people that speak. So we have some areas where it's 100% uh, the first language is Welsh. And that's the, that's the language you'll hear spoken in the streets. It's the language that will be communicated by local government and by national government in these areas. But you can see that there are some areas where less than 10% of the population uh, speak Welsh as the first language. Uh, let's look at another political um, aspect. Let's look at the Brexit vote. And what we find is in yellow, these are the areas in Wales which voted to remain in the EU. And blue are the areas which, by majority, voted to leave the EU. And then if we look at political parties, we have uh, Labour, which is socialist, in red. And then we have, you can't, you can't really see it here, but it's a blue colour. These are... Um, uh, right-wing party, Conservatives, this is a national election, these are m um, MPs that go to Westminster. And then we have Nationalists in green. Anglesey flits between Socialist and Nationalist. However, I think all of this is really irrelevant. Uh, the most important thing is to actually understand what local people and local landowners think, irrespective of what these sort of uh, maps may well give you as an impression of what you expect them to think. So essentially, if you're going to succeed in eradication, you have to spend a lot of time engaging and understanding the local communities and what their respective views are. If we go to Anglesey and we look at the landscape that we see there, we see a very agricultural landscape with fragmented woodlands. Um, this is a picture of a, one of them, which is a, a community park um, located in the, in, in the centre of the island, in, uh, near a village called Clangefni, which is the administrative heart. On the mainland, uh, slate was one of the major industries, and there are still working slate quarries that are there. And they have, uh, obviously, they have a, a, a heritage. That can be positive in, in terms of economic um, benefits to the region, and that can be negative in terms of history, and this is a, this is a, a placard from 1900. In Welsh, Nidoes Bradur in a Tihun, it means there's no traitors in this house. And this was related to a massive industrial action that took place between 1900 and 1903, where strikers showed this placard in their window, and those that went back to work in the quarry would have removed the placard from their windows. So you had division in community. This still has a legacy and it still resonates today. 
over a hundred years later. And so you have to understand these things as you start the process of engaging with communities. Anglesey, I was trying to find famous figures from Anglesey and the best I could come up with is Lemmy from Motorhead, but also uh, the best 4x4 that's ever been manufactured globally was made there. This is the Land Rover and it was trialled in Anglesey back in the 1940s. So this is the history of, this, of the location. Let's look at it in terms of um, uh, some, some overhead figures. The population is around about 70,000. Agriculture is the main industry. It's probably one of the few places in Europe that's hoping that someone will build a nuclear power station there. There's massive support for a nuclear power station, including from the Nationalist Party, which has a policy of no nuclear building, except on Anglesey. And this is because there's no work there. Tourism is incredibly important. And the Red Squirrel is incredibly important to tourism on this island. It has a port which links Wales with Ireland, and this is a key economic trade route between the EU member states and that island. So the Grey Squirrels arrived in, in the UK in 1876, but they got into Wales in the 1940s, and they were, they were first found over here in this county of Flintshire, and probably took them about 20 years. They've marched straight across 60 miles, uh, that's going to be about 80 kilometres, and then they got onto the island of Anglesey in 1966. If we look at the woodland distribution on the island, what we find is it's a, a bit like an artist who's dipped their paintbrush into a, a, a pot of green paint and then flicked it onto a white canvas. It's a very uh, sporadic, uh, fragmented landscape of forests, largely broadleaf. And this is where we did the grey squirrel eradication. Red squirrel was ex almost extinct when we started in 1998. There were only 40 animals still alive, and they were all within one conifer forest, which is here, Pentraith, Monath, Clwyddiaeth, and Welsh. And the eradication of 710 square kilometres, plus another 10 square kilometres up here, um, took us to 2013. And it was started by two people who were both in their 80s, Esme Kirby and her husband, Peter. Esme started it, 1998, uh, she told me she wouldn't live to see it uh, finishing, but that wasn't the point. It's a bit like when you plant trees. You plant them not for yourself, but you plant them for future generations to enjoy. And she saw an opportunity to eradicate a uh, grey squirrel from an island. Her first husband uh, was famous because he wrote this book, which became a bestseller in the 1930s. Uh, if you're interested, you can read the book. She's in it. Uh, they bought a mountain. He was a Canadian. He'd never farmed before. He bought 10,000 acres of sheep farm and they wrote a story about their lives in the, in, in the mountains. And so Squirrel HQ had no, really no woodland at all, a few trees in the middle of a, a, a landscape that was full of sheep, miles from the island, and this is where we plotted the strategy for the removal of the grey squirrels. So in summary, this is all very easy, uh, we look at 1998 through to 2013, and this is the percentage of sites that still had grey squirrels as we trapped, and they declined down to extinction. And then the columns show you uh, the number of sites that we trapped. We had no money at the beginning. So our ambition was eradication, but we didn't have the budget. In 2001, uh, foot and mouth disease hit agriculture in the UK. And um, all movement in the countryside between farms stopped to try and prevent the movement of this pathogen. And so we had to stop. So for six months, we stopped. And then we ran out of money in 2011. And the, the only reason there was any trapping done at all was because those of us that had been involved in the project continued to cull grey squirrels on a voluntary basis because we knew we were close to eradication. And this is the last animal that we found. It was a male, uh, it was actually shot in the middle of Anglesey in 2013. We take that Anglesey data and we, we um, calibrate it, looking at the amount of man years that it took to do the eradication. And then if you add those uh, along with other successful mainland EU eradications of species like mink and porcupine, what you find is there's a nice pattern. Anglesey's here. And so about 700 square kilometres it's going to take you, and you can read off, depending on what species you pick, how much man years, and then you can cost it out. And politicians love this stuff, because you can give them a, a real-world sense of how much it's going to cost 
to remove uh, a particular species from an environment. And you can actually add the, the data from the mainland sites with uh, classic small island eradications, and again, you've still got this uh, linear relationship. So the larger the size of the, of the area, the, the more it costs, or the more ma manpower you, is required. Land ac access is essential, and here we've got um, some people that actually release invasive species, pheasants, and then control invasive species for fun, pheasants. They own land and they manage land for that purpose, uh, sporting estates. We have farm woodlands, we have um, gardens where householders live, scrub and hedgerow habitats, and state forests. And we have to get access in order to cull these animals. In other words, we have to be ambassadors for the eradication and control of invasive species and win over and persuade everyone who has uh, the, the gift of access to give to allow us in. Many people find grey squirrels quite fun and have them on their bird tables, enjoy watching them. And we had to go to those individuals and say, we want to kill your grey squirrels in order to put red squirrels back in. And on Anglesey, we were granted access to almost all the sites. There were a small number of um, householders who wouldn't let us in, but all of the woodlands I showed you, permission was granted. If we then look at um, effort uh, that we took to eradicate and we change it, so we either reduce by 20% or we increase by 20% the effort, we can make a prediction using models to suggest whether or not we would have achieved eradication earlier or later or at all. And so when we look at 80% of the effort, it's probably not clear to, to those of you at the back of the room, but essentially this, this black bar is the, is the population of grey squirrel that would be left, the residual, and it bounces along, comes close to zero, but it bounces back up. In other words, 80% of the effort wouldn't have been enough. And this uh, box here is giving you a, a probability of eradication, and it's blank, because there was zero, no chance. Interestingly, the red squirrel population was modelled to increase nevertheless. Then we look at increasing the trap effort, and we've got green bars, which mean probability, and these latter three are 100% prob probability. And when we look at when the eradication would take place, it was a couple of years earlier. So more effort in the eradication uh, allowed us to complete eradication more swiftly. And this is published in Ecological Modelling, if you're interested and like to learn more about it. My whole uh, thesis and ESME's and all the project partners has been to be very open about killing grey squirrels. They're incredibly damaging. They shouldn't be in the UK. We cannot harvest them. Uh, we got pressure and people suggesting we shouldn't kill lactating females or pregnant animals. I'm sorry. If we allow those animals to breed and produce offspring, we then have to catch the offspring. And cumulatively, you will have more suffering than you would have if you're efficient and remove the population quickly. So we have headlines like this. I published uh, last year in a, in a, uh, a scientific um, magazine, online magazine, um, and gave all the evidence that there was to back up our thesis that uh, grey squirrels should be removed from the UK. The, the media uh, coverage we've had has always been positive right from the beginning. Uh, when we eradicated, this is just the BBC headline, but it was in the Guardian and the Daily Mail, no one was saying bring the grey squirrels back. None of the public said we want them back because they all had red squirrels back and they were all pleased to have them back. During the eradication, we were actually asking for people to report grey squirrels and they did. They told us when they saw them on the island so we could go and then kill them. So the grey squirrel eradication took place. It was difficult because of, those, because of the foot and mouth and because of uh, limitations on funding. What was the red squirrel response? Well, this figure shows two things. The first in the, in the red dots are uh, percentage of recruitment. These are young animals which are still present in the population six months after they have been first caught. And so they've, become, they've essentially become, they've survived, if you like, to become adults. And we can see fairly high uh, percentage of survival and then it drops right down. In parallel with that, we have population estimate within the small forest fragment that red squirrels were resident in, and they were increasing in number. And as they increased in number, the dispersal pressure that was put on juveniles by adults 
became more and more intense and that caused dispersal out of the forest and a, pot a potential for recolonization of the rest of the island. However, note where the geography is. It's in the corner here and it's a very fragmented landscape. So to speed things up, we did a reintroduction of red squirrels into Newborough Forest, which is situated in the opposite southern corner. This is the largest area of forest on the island. This is a sand dune system that was planted up with Corsican pine back in the 1940s and 50s. And we had captive red squirrels in captivity uh, permanently, males and females, mixed pair, so that they would breed and we would release the offspring. That was the strategy. We wanted to demonstrate that captive animals could be used in translocation quite successfully. You didn't have to translocate from the wild. And the result in the first year, 2004, was astounding. We had, we had extremely good survival of adults. We had very high productivity and survival of young within the enclosures. And we were able to start releasing animals. So we had approximately two young animals uh, weaned per adult. Those youngsters were then released into the forest and we started the process again the next year. However, in the next year, we lost almost all of the captive animals to a disease outbreak. We have some of the top pathologists in the UK looking at the animals and they were unable to tell us a definitive cause of death. At the same time, uh, there was a publication about adenovirus causing epidemic disease in small cluster groups of animals in the north of England. And this is a virus that produces uh, lesions inside the intestines, and this is a, a micrograph of one. And here we have the arrows to the actual viral particles. And there are, there are thousands, tens of thousands of viral particles being pushed out into the intestine. It's an incredibly difficult um, infection to manage because the animal doesn't show any external symptoms. It may have diarrhea or scouring at some latter point in the disease, but early on doesn't have to have. And to be honest, a lot of the animals simply drop dead. They look otherwise healthy. And so it was only through retrospective testing that over the years using archive material and genetic tests we were able to demonstrate that this virus was associated with this massive outbreak in our captive population. So we changed the method and the approach to translocation. And in this figure, I show you uh, where the original remnant population was if, uh, when the grey squirrels were on the island. Then our reintroduction in Newborough, and then numerous other smaller scale translocations just using adult animals, no breeding and releasing the animals after two to three weeks. And the result of this was that the, the translocations were ultimately a success and Newborough was full of red squirrels. However, we'd learned that even though we were doing screening of animals for viral pathogens, we'd been unable to detect the presence of this particular virus, adenovirus, at a subclinical level, i.e. when it's not causing any uh, disease symptoms. Latterly, we started to look at the wider captive population of red squirrels in the UK. This has all come from our work on Anglesey. And we looked at where did uh, captive animals come from and where did they go and did they have adenovirus infection. And we looked at animals which died and we screened them, um, looked at veterinary reports. Again, it's published here um, in, um, I can't remember which journal it is, but last year anyway, um, uh, 2017. Um, what we found was, there's my work, and yes, the virus was being moved around, unbeknown to us. Then we start to put protocols in place to detect it. Um, blood's not a good me uh, method of detection. And then we have this institution here, which is moving, at, continuing to move animals, even though they now know they have the infection present. And they're moving animals which are actually dying from the infection. So they're moving animals that are that are diseased and ultimately will perish. So they're moving viral particles around the UK and um, we think this should stop. And so we've been lobbying the government that uh, translocations really need to have proper viral screening in place before they take place. The result of all of this, this challenge of um, adenovirus, is that we've developed a non-invasive method of determining infection. So we can tell now, without, without the need to take spleen samples from animals, spleen's the best tissue, 
Uh, we've, we've got this non-invasive method. We can use this in routine health checks of animals before they're moved, but also we can apply it to other mammal translocations. Um, and part of the IUCN guidelines uh, recommend that people have pre-movement and post-movement um, infection surveillance. And so we can look at grey squirrel, wild grey squirrels and the residual populations of grey squirrels, see if they have viral infections. But also we can look at red squirrel only populations and look at those without the need to catch animals and look at those populations and work out changes in uh, viral presence. All of this has turned Anglesey from grey squirrel to red squirrel. And here we have road signs. There are road signs up everywhere. There are road bridges over roads to stop animals being squashed. And the tourist industry promotes um, red squirrel the brochures and all of the uh, locations that you can see red squirrels are heavily marketed because Anglesey runs on tour the tourist dollar. In terms of genetics, what we found was we had one haplotype, uh, so one bloodline in the beginning. This is ANG1, uh, shown here in yellow. And then we did varying translocations of different uh, bloodlines. Let's call them bloodlines, haplotypes. Um, these are ones that we put in in different forests. And in red, in 2011, we already had movement of haplotypes between woodland areas. So uh, we put a haplotype into woodland A, we're finding it in woodland B. So we're having, we've, for the first time, we've got evidence of um, a fluidity in the red squirrel population. And yet we've, we did all the translocations of red squirrel before the grey squirrel was eradicated. And as you know, grey squirrels in the UK carry squirrel pox virus. What we didn't know, but we know now, is that we rode our luck and something was happening in the residual population of grey squirrel. And this shows you percentage uh, of positive animals to squirrel pox virus through time. And what we find is, as we cull the population, the level of viral presence, the, the signature of the virus in antibodies declines to zero. The virus burned itself out. But if we go across, whoops, if we go across to Gwyneth on the other side of the Menai Strait, this across the Sea Strait to the mainland, and we test uh, grey squirrels there, we find they're positive. So we've eradicated to a boundary, but remember the grey squirrel got onto Anglesey in the 60s, and it will continue to get onto Anglesey unless we prevent it. It causes squirrel pox virus, um, but also this is confused from, from a reporting perspective by other viruses, other um, conditions, and here's exudative dermatitis, and here's another one which we're about to publish on. This is a new skin lesion um, never found in red squirrels before in Europe, and we've got cluster mortality of it. Again, it just leads to more confusing when the Republic are uh, reporting sick animals. To make it even more complicated, in 2009, red squirrels crossed the Menai Strait and started to colonise the mainland, which is full of grey squirrels. So these different coloured asterisks refer to different locations on the mainland of red. And this is a breeding female here, and she lives on the coast. So we have, a, we have a mixed population, again, which causes us some challenges because of squirrel pox virus, the risk that the virus will be picked up by reds, and the risk that reds on the mainland will cross back onto Anglesey and give the red squirrels on Anglesey the squirrel pox virus. And indeed, last autumn we had a, the first wild squirrel pox outbreak in Wales, and these X's denote positive cases. Perversely, at the same time, we had exudative dermatitis, another skin lesion, but not caused by pox, on the Anglesey side. So the whole of Anglesey held its breath. Local people did not want squirrel pox virus affecting their red squirrels, the red squirrels that are there that have replaced the grey squirrels we eradicated. The challenges we had is that we used uh, cameras to try and detect squirrel pox virus and of course, when you start to zoom in, you get pixelation. You don't get great, clear pictures like this. So we spend hours looking at pixelated pictures of red squirrels, wondering if they may or may not have the beginnings of a lesion. The result of all of this was that um, the public reacted very positively. Uh, they took down feeders on the island where they're feeding squirrels. They, took, they, they stopped. They cleaned everything. The press, national press, covered it. We said we've got to cull more grey squirrels. The press covered it. 
the reaction from the public, cull more grey squirrels. If it means saving these red squirrels, then remove the invasive grey squirrel from the Gwyneth side of the straits. Um, and here's one of them. This is again in the BBC. And then this is a small community group on Anglesey, about uh, 15 kilometres from where the outbreak was. And they've posted this to tell the public why they're not feeding squirrels anymore and to inform the public of the squirrel pox outbreak. So we learned that the outbreaks um, that can take place don't necessarily have to be epidemic. We only had a small number of animals, unlike uh, Julian Chantry's paper from Formby. The public were very sympathetic towards uh, our work and got involved in it, reported sick animals or where they suspected sick animals. But we'll never know whether if things were different, the virus may well have got across the straits. And so this could happen again. So we have a success in red squirrel and we have a success with the eradication of grey. And then we have conflict. But the conflict, our conflict wasn't with animal rights groups. Our conflict was with government agencies. And this is another picture of Newbury Forest. And um, this is what the government wanted to turn it into. So we've eradicated grey, put in red, and they wanted to fell two-thirds of the forest and make it back into sand dune system. It's, it's, next, oh, it's actually part of an SAC, Special Area of Conservation, although the forest is defined as forest. It's not defined as containing any of the annex features. So I've got to make that clear. The result of their proposal was a massive outcry from the public. And between us, there were only four red squirrels actually out in the forest at that time. And yet the public said, don't fell the forest because there are red squirrels living there. Every week, there were negative stories about felling forests, which would adversely affect red squirrel. And after seven years of debate and various committees, a, a plan was produced for the forest a plan which gave a commitment to having a red squirrel specific document written within a year, a plan for the management and conservation of red squirrels. That was the agreement that we had from the Welsh Government. Eighteen months later, there's no plan. And so I wrote to the Minister and asked, where's the plan? And the Minister's reply was that his officials had opened dialogue with us, which wasn't true. They hadn't. Um, I then wrote again in September and said I've heard nothing and the minister said his officials were willing to work with our project, which is interesting because we already had a management plan that tied their hands to working with us. And then at Christmas they said the plan, the basis of the plan was agreed. They had a plan in place, which again was news to me because we hadn't discussed anything with them. All that had happened really is they put Red Squirrel on their logo for that particular forest. So. This always happens with government. You beat the civil servants, they don't like it. And then something happens, in this case, a merger of agencies. And when they merged, I wrote to the government, this time using uh, freedom of information. They had to show me what's on the files and asked to see the plan that had been written that we supposedly agreed. And they said that no steps had been taken to produce a plan. And they apologized and said the whole thing was down to an internal misunderstanding. Now, all of this is taking place during the eradication of gray squirrels. So when people say to me, it took you 15 years to eradicate them, I say we had foot and mouth disease, we had all of this nonsense to deal with. We had various other issues and we were doing translocations. So it's much more complicated than the headline figure. It, arguing wastes time. And I'm glad that all of this is behind us. We actually have a really vibrant partnership now with uh, the, the, the agency Natural Resources Wales and, and they're, par they're partners in our current life project. This brings me on to the last thing I want to talk about, which is the EU regulation. And uh, it's an excuse to show my picture of Angela Merkel with a grey squirrel on her shoulder. This is, a, this is a great piece of legislation. It's come in. The Welsh Government have reacted to it. And like all administrations, they have to produce a plan to tackle invasives, prevent their, trans, their, their movement, prevent their, their, detect their, their arrival, etc., etc. What we know from Anglesey is that Anglesey is not an island. It's a peninsula. It has a movement of grey squirrels back and forwards and red squirrels back and forwards. You can pick different points in time when that's occurring. To put Anglesey in context, it's shown here in green, it's red squirrel only. We have a few, it's hard to see here, but most of these are black squares, which means red squirrels are now extinct. There's a few uh, blue squares where there are red squirrels with grey squirrels. There are about 300 red squirrels here. 
If Anglesey had gone extinct, there'd be 300 red squirrels in Wales, which would be the worst um, figure f of any of the um, member nations of the United Kingdom. 300 red squirrels, and yet we have Anglesey. What's happened on Anglesey since the eradication is that in 2015, we had a series of incursion events where grey squirrels turned up more than 10 kilometres apart, and we had to find them. We had to find them, and we had to kill them, and we had to blood test them, we had to worry about what they were carrying. And all of this success, whoops, all of this success in detection and removal was down to local people telling us what they'd seen. And so they shared on social media, they thought they'd seen a, a squirrel. In fact, they delayed telling us for more than two days. Each one delayed because they didn't think there were any grey squirrels on the island and therefore they'd be wasting our time. In fact, they all turned out to be correct. How are the grey squirrels getting onto the island? We have two bridges and they're about to build a third bridge. We have ferry traffic from the Irish Republic to the Port of Holyhead. We have rail freight. We have road freight. Uh, we have uh, the intentional uh, movement and dumping, illegal dumping of grey squirrels. And we suspect that's what's happened in 2017, where two animals have turned up on the island of uh, Holy Island at the north of Anglesey. Those two animals uh, should not be there. There were never any grey squirrels, even before we did the eradication. And we have video of one of the animals, and it's quite clearly an, a, a young animal, and everyone I've shown the video to agrees. This is an animal which has been placed in that woodland. This is a picture from the mainland from last year, and this is an animal that was hit by a car in Clamberis in Gwynedd, uh, about 10 kilometres from Anglesey, and it, and it ended up going through the grill unharmed and got trapped in the engine bay. And the only reason they knew it was there was they stopped to buy an ice cream, and the driver heard a noise from his engine bay, popped the bonnet and had a look inside with a torch, and here he's got a little stowaway that's inside. So grey squirrels can move around the country, and we know from Lisa Signorelli's work, her genetics work, uh, that grey squirrels have been translocated many, many tens of kilometres accidentally by road users. So our focus is on trying to find ways to prevent re-incursion, and that means a focus in on the port of Holyhead. And we, we're working with our partners in Ireland and the others in Red Squirrels United to try and achieve that. Our, our network of 190 uh, garden woodland owners. These are people who are looking out for invasive species, such as the fox squirrel, not present in the UK, but potentially could invade. And part of our uh, outreach is to produce a new book in Welsh, in the Welsh language, to empower local communities to understand about nature conservation and invasive species. The Welsh language is hungry for scientific literature in their own language. And so I would say to all of you, if you have a new publication coming out, translate it into Welsh. It will be war warmly welcomed by the Welsh Government and all in Wales. So lastly, and before Connor speaks, um, we had a project, a little project in the mainland called Painting the Town Red a few years ago. That evolved into the new life project, um, uh, Scudious Life. And our part in, in Wales uh, covers the, the, the city of Bangor, so we're eradicating a uh, grey squirrel from uh, a, a city, a university city with 20,000 people and a landscape of 190 square kilometres around about it. And we're doing this through out loads of more outreach this time uh, on the mainland. So the, the, the lessons that we've learned, well, um, we were successful in eradication, but the eradication was only to a boundary, which is the worst sort of eradication. We've picked an arbitrary geographical boundary and we know grey squirrels can move across. We've got community support for uh, culling. I would argue, though, that you have to have the red squirrel in the landscape somewhere in order to get the level of community support that we had. Uh, we understood and we're part of the, the community. I live there. My children have grown up there. I understand the, the, what the local people are about. I can speak their language. And that, make, that gives us a huge advantage when we're talking with them. We need to have funding for a rapid reaction. And I've said this many times to many colleagues. Uh, Carl Larson in, in, in Canada, who's working on Grey Squirrels, told me this. If you phoned the fire brigade and said you had a fire 
and they told you, OK, we'll come when we've raised the money to fight it, you'd be on the phone to the politicians. Why don't we have money in place for rapid reaction for invasive species? There should be money in place for that. We need to understand more about the invasive uh, mechanisms and we have to understand more about the movements of viral pathogens within animals. So we're, oops, my spelling mistake at the bottom. We need to empower local communities with all of the knowledge to understand this so when we go away, they can pick up the ball and run with the project in our absence. And then I was going to leave you with something which I've, I've given to all my students and all my colleagues and partners and friends who are involved in invasive management in North Wales. This is a fantastic section of a speech by Teddy Roosevelt. It was given to the French in 1910. Uh, it's called, the, the actual speech is called Citizenship in the Republic. And essentially, it boils down to the fact that you have, there's nothing wrong with trying your hardest, even though it may well be that what you're doing is essentially incredibly difficult. There will always be people that will scoff and remark that it's impossible. But at least you're trying, and it's much better to try than not to try at all. And then finally, my thanks to my colleagues, various colleagues who've been uh, involved in the project over the last 20 years, and all of the anonymous citizens without whom we would not have been able to eradicate Grey Squirrel. Thank you very much.